DMT is the strongest hallucinogen there is. If it's if it's possible to get more loaded than, than that, I don't want to know about it. And I say so when I'm there. I say, my God, if you can get more loaded than this, keep it away from me. Uh, so that's it. It's the strongest. It's also the shortest acting. DMT, when smoked, in most people, is return you to normal in under 10 minutes. Under 10 minutes. Now, this is interesting because the people who, who think there's nothing to this who don't who should actually invest the 10 minutes to find out what's you know t- a 10 minute DMT DMT trip is worth 20 years of academic pharmacology art history <laughs> psychology and all this other malarkey because then you just say okay I got it I got it another very interesting thing about DMT is it occurs naturally in the human brain Well, now, what's going on here? He's saying the strongest drug, the fastest drug, is the most natural drug. It means that, you know, you don't have to sail off into 3-hydroxy-4-pyridyl-N-methyl-marubishtik or something like that (laughs) to get into the exotic realms. No, a human metabolite, which takes only 10 minutes to undergo its entire uh, exfoliation and quenching, is the strongest of all. Well, then, what is it? What does strong mean? What is a strong psychedelic? Uh, you know, it's it's highly uh, personal. Every psychedelic trip is, but what happens on DMT for a large number of people? I mean, we don't have any statistics, but it is a completely confounding experience. I mean, you may have had the expectation, you might think if you had never had a psychedelic experience that it sort of begins like uh, the Bach B minor fugue and goes from there as you rise into the realms of light and union with the deity or something like that. That's not what happens on DMT. What happens on DMT, I referred to this morning. Uh, A troop of elves smashes down your front door and rotates and balances the wheels on the after-death vehicle, present you with the bill, and then depart. And it's completely paradigm-shattering. I mean, you know, union with the white light you could handle. Uh, An invasion of your apartment by jeweled self-dribbling basketballs from hyperspace that are speaking in demotic Greek is not something that you anticipated and could handle. Sometimes people say, uh, is DMT dangerous? It sounds so crazy. Is it dangerous? The answer is only if you fear death by astonishment. (laughs) Remember how you laugh when this possibility was raised and a moment will come that will wipe the smile right off your face. And this death by astonishment thing, uh, well, one thing about it, I mean, let me say a little bit more about it. One thing that endears DMT to me is I like to say it doesn't affect your mind. It doesn't seem to affect your mind. In other words, uh, you don't change under the influence of DMT. You don't become a kinder, gentler person. You don't sink into, you know, a line of drool from one corner of your mouth as you sit there twitching. You don't change. What happens is the world is completely replaced. Instantly, 100%, it's all gone. And what is put in its place, not one iota of what is put in its place was taken from this world. 
life. So it's a 100% reality channel switch. They don't even retain three-dimensional space and linear time. It's not like you go to an exotic place, Morocco or New Guinea. It's like you uh, reality is swapped out for something else. And when you try to say what it is, you realize that language has evolved in this world and it can serve no other. In, or it must it takes years of practice. So what you're looking at is literally the unspeakable. <coughs> the indescribable falls into your lap. And when you try, you're loaded, right? You're there and you're trying to explain to yourself what's happening. And so this is like you try to pour water over the transdimensional objects in front of you, the water of language, and it just beads up and flows off like water off a duck's back. You cannot say what's there. And I've spent, I don't know, 25 years fiddling with this. It's become the compass of my inspiration, trying to say what is on the other side of that boundary. Just two large tokes away at any given time is this non-Euclidean, non-Newtonian, irrational, un-Englishable place. But it's not smooth and empty and clear. That's not what gives it its indescribability. What gives it its indescribability is its utter weirdness, its alienness, its power to astonish. Uh, what happens to me when I smoke DMT is um, there's a there's a kind of a going toward it. There's a sequela of events which lead to the antechamber of the mystery. I mean, you take a toke, you feel strange. Your whole body feels odd. You take a second toke, all the oxygen seems to have been pumped out of the room. Everything jumps into clarity. It's that visual acuity thing. You take a third toke if you're able, and then you lay back and you see this thing which looks like a rose or a chrysanthemum, this orange spinning flower-like thing. It takes it about 15 seconds to form, and it's like a membrane. And then you break through it. You break through it, and then you're in this place. And there's an enormous cheer which goes up as you pass through this membrane. You'll, some of you may know the Pink Floyd song about how the gnomes have learned a new way to say hooray. They're waiting. And you burst in to this place and you're saying, you know, geez, you know, this stuff is really speedy. I mean, that's like describing a space shuttle launching as noisy, you know. You say, this stuff is, it's, you know, and you say, am I all right? Am I all right? That's the first question. And so then you run your mind around the track and you say, hmm, heartbeat, normal, yeah, normal, heartbeat, normal, uh, pulse, normal, breathing, breathe, 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 yes, and, but what's right here, right here and from here out is this thing, which no matter how much science fiction you've done, no matter how much William Burroughs you've read, no matter how much time you've spent in the company of the weird, the bizarre, the outre, and the peculiar, you weren't ready. And it's completely real. In a, it's in a way more real than the contents of ordinary reality because see how the shadows here are muted and there's a lot of... Uh, transitional zones from one color to another and so forth. This isn't like that. This is crystalline, clear, solid. You can see the light reflected in the depths of these objects and everything is very brightly colored and everything is moving very, very rapidly. And there are entities there. It's not about calling them up or the whisperings of them. Or, no, they're in your face. 
and they're right here, and they they're they're worse than in your face because what they do is they they jump into your chest, and then they jump out, and so you're like this. And, and you have to keep saying, keep breathing, keep breathing, don't freak out, pay attention. And, and the entities speak to you. And they, and they speak both in English and another way, which we'll get to in a minute. But in English, what they say is, do not give way to wonder. Hang on. Don't just go gaga with disbelief. Pay attention. Pay attention. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to show you something. They are, they are very aware of the fleeting nature of this encounter. And they say, you know, don't just spiral off into amazement and start raving about God and all that. Forget that. Pay attention to what we're doing. And then what they're doing is they're dancing around, they're jumping around, they're emerging explicitly out of the background, bounding toward you, jumping into your chest, bounding away, and they offer, they make offerings, and they love you. That's the other thing. They say this. They say, we love you. You, you come so rarely. And, you know, here you are. Welcome, welcome. And then they, sh they make these offerings. And the offerings are objects of some sort. And, the, and now remember, you are not changed. You're exactly the person you were a few minutes before. So you're not exalted or depressed. You're just trying to make sense of this. And the objects which they offer are like um, Fabergé eggs or exquisitely tooled and enameled pieces of machinery, but they don't have rigid outlines. These objects are themselves somehow alive and transforming and changing. So when these creatures, I call them tykes, when these tykes <laughs> offer you these objects, you like, you grok it, you look at it, and immediately, because you are yourself, you have this realization, my God, if I could get this thing back into my world, history would never be the same. A single one of these objects is somehow, you can tell by looking at it, this would confound my world beyond hope of recovery. It cannot exist. What I'm being shown is a tiny area where miracles are being transformed. And they then, and the creatures, the tykes, are singing. They are speaking in a kind of translinguistic glossolalia. They are actually making these objects with their voices. They are singing these things into existence. And what the message is, is do what we're doing. You can do what we're doing. Do it. And they get quite pushy about this. They say, you know, damn it, do it. And you're saying, but, 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 but. And saying, no, do it. Do it now. Do it. And say, I can't handle this, you know. And then this kind of reaction goes on for a while. Well, then I actually, I don't, I don't take credit for it. It was not willed. But like something comes up from inside of you. Something comes out of you and you discover you can do it. That you can use language to condense objects into existence in this space. It's the dream of all magic. But here it is, folks, happening in real time. And, uh, and then they're just delighted. They just go mad with delight and turn somersaults and turn themselves inside out. And they all jump into your chest at once. And, and after many, many uh, encounters of this sort, I mean, when I first did DMT, I couldn't bring anything out of it. I mean, I just 
said, you know, it's the damnedest thing I've ever encountered and I can't say anything about it and I don't think I ever will be able to say anything about it. But by going back repeatedly and working at it, I think I've gotten a pretty coherent... Well, let's not go that far. I think I've got a pretty uh, clear metaphor, anyway, for what's happening in there. And I think a lot of people have this experience. When you talk to shamans, they say, oh, well, yes, the helping spirits. Those are the helping spirits. They can help you cure, find lost objects. You didn't know about helping spirits? I said, well, I knew, I, but I, I, I had no idea, you know, that it was so literal. I say, oh, no, that's the helping spirits. And that, but then the other thing they say, if you press a shaman, if you say, well, what exactly is a helping spirit? Say, well, a helping spirit is an ancestor. Say, you mean to tell me that those are dead people in there? Say, well, yes, ancestor, dead person. You didn't know about ancestors, apparently. This is what happens to people who die. And you say, my God, is it possible that what we're breaking into here is an ecology of souls? That these are not extraterrestrials from Zenebel Ganubi or Zeta Reticuli Beta. These are the dear departed. And they exist in a realm which, for want of a better word, let's call eternity. And somehow this drug, or whatever it is, is allowing me to see across the, ba the veil. Th this is the lifting. You want to talk about boundary dissolution. It's one thing to get tight to your partner. It's quite another to get tight to the dear departed of centuries past. That's a serious boundary dissolution when that happens. Uh, what these creatures want, according to them, is they want us to transform our language somehow. And I don't know what this means. I mean, at this point in the weekend and in my life, we all are on the cutting edge and nobody is ahead of anybody else. Uh, clearly, we need to transform our language because our culture is created by our language and our culture is toxic, murderous and on a downhill bummer. Somehow we need to transform our language. But is this what they mean? That we're supposed to condense machines out of the air in front of us? Uh, how does this relate to the persistent idea promulgated by Robert Graves and other people that there is a primal language of poetry? That poetry as we know it is a pale, pale thing. And that at some time in the human past, people were in command of languages which literally compel belief. They compel belief because they don't make an appeal through argument or uh, metaphor. They compel belief because they are able to present themselves as imagery. You know, William Blake said, if the truth can be told so as to be understood, it will be believed. And so these things uh, have, and it's very confusing because you wonder, you say, well, have people been doing this for thousands of years? And if so, have they always encountered this tremendous urgency on the other side? If people have been doing it for thousands of years, why is there this urgency on the part of these entities? And who exactly and what exactly are they? Uh, I, I, uh, it, uh, in, it appalls me, you can probably tell, that I have to talk about this because I am not... This is not my bailiwick. I mean, I'm a rationalist who's just had a very weird uh, set of experiences, but I am a rationalist. I mean, I have no patience with channeling, you know, the lords of the many rays, the divas, and, you know, there's this whole thing going around about disincarnate intelligence, and it's mostly in the, under the control of 
fairly, shall we say, non-rigorous thinkers. Uh, But I like to think that I am a rigorous thinker, and yet here I am telling you that, you know, elf legions await in hyperspace one toke away. The difference between my rap and, uh, you know, the Findhorn folks or somebody like that is that we have an operational method for testing my assertion. We can all smoke DMT, or you can make it your business to now find out about this and see for yourself. And not everybody agrees with me. I mean, some people say, you know, it wasn't anything like that. But some people agree, and I think if you get two out of ten agreeing with a rap like this, then you better pay attention. (laughs) Yeah, somebody... Um, you said that uh, no amount of meditation or anything else prepares you for it. And, I mean, I've certainly smoked a fair amount of DMT, and I maybe not 50 times, but probably approaching it that, that, and I'm still not prepared for it. Each time, it seems like, I mean, all the times before haven't prepared me for what I get into. Is there a point where you found that you are prepared? No, you're never prepared because, in fact... And I mentioned this last night. Something goes on in the DMT flash that I don't think anyone can bring back. There is at the core of the experience something is revealed that is so appalling that nobody can bring it back into ordinary reality. And that's why it's hard to understand because, as you know, I've done it a number of times and every time I approach it, it scares me shitless. I cannot approach it any other way. And it's physical. I mean, my palms sweat. I can't hold the pipe. My hand shakes. I wish I hadn't gotten myself into this situation. I fear it like death itself. That's the clue, folks. Uh, I think that what happens, and I've reached this opinion by, by reason and rationalization, not by direct experience. I think that what happens at the center of the mandala of that experience is that you do understand that these are souls. You have some kind of experience which converts you to this view beyond a shadow of a doubt. I'm not saying you meet your dead grandmother, but it's something like that. And that experience is simultaneously so um, affirming and at the same time so paradigm shattering that you can't, you can't retain it. You, you return to this world with a story of jeweled self-transforming basketballs and Fabergé eggs and a lesson in hyper-language. But there is a moment, I think, where you find out something truly, truly paradigm-shattering that you can't even tell yourself it's such an appalling revelation. And the only thing I can think of that would fill that bill is something about the nature of life and death. That you actually go under the board, you find out the thing which nobody is ever supposed to find out in this world. And I suspect it's what shamans know. That that a shaman is a person who knows the unspeakable secret. And once you know it, you know, there's no going back. I mean, you become fey, enchanted. You're touched by the other. You now are a part of fairyland. And this gives you, I don't know what it gives you, charisma, magical power, healing, the possibility to heal. But it also sets you apart from your fellows because they don't know from it. They don't know. I mean, science can't survive in that environment for half a minute. The entire construct of Western reason disappears into that dimension like hurling an ice cube into a blast furnace. You know, it just can't survive that encounter. If flying saucers were to land on the south lawn of the White House tomorrow, it wouldn't change the fact that DMT is the weirdest thing in the universe.